So we are now going to begin a conversation called Facing Each Other, Putting the Money Where Our Hearts Are. And I am pleased to welcome up to stage Latasha Brown, Chris Daggett, Sharnita Johnson, Maureen Knighton, and Dr. Glenda Price. So please give them a big welcome and please come on up on stage. <clears throat> Keep it going, come on. Make them feel welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's excellent. I think everyone has to have a favorite person up on the stage, right? I mean, you are probably among the five best known people in this room. Um, so I think we just had a really important conversation in that last session. And I think we started having a real conversation. And so I'd love to try and get that started. So I debated whether to start with yeah. this question. And I've decided I'm going to throw it out, and if we hate it, we'll just throw it away and answer a different question. But Paul, when he was leaving, said, are we climbing the wrong mountain, right? So I have a slightly different take on that. Do we need to think about the symphony orchestra as a culturally specific organization? Is the symphony orchestra a Western European organization, and we need to understand it as a culturally specific organization? We don't look at taiko drumming organizations and say there are too many Japanese and Japanese American people in it. Anyone's welcome to join, but we think that's fine. Or is this the right mountain? Is this where we need to be climbing? So that's a terrible question, and it's meant to be provocative. And Latasha never has nothing to not say. So I'm going to start at the far end. Of course you would start. <laughs> of course with me. I'm going to start. And feel and again, feel free to answer oh. a different question, but that's. That's where I was left at the end of that last session. Are we climbing the wrong mountain? Butterfly, take to the sky. Spread your wings and open them wide. No longer can you stay there and hide. Beautiful butterfly, butterfly. And I started that singing to answer. <laughs> but I, I started that song for a particular reason, because I actually, um, it, it's part of the answer, I think, to that question. Um, in the eighth grade, I lived in a little community. I grew up in a little community that you all may have heard of called Selma, Alabama. And in the community that I'm from, um, I never had the opportunity to see the orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, or the symphony, I would see on television, and quite frankly, I was introduced on Sesame Street. And I remember um, during Black History Month in my seventh grade, in uh, my seventh grade year, I was introduced to Lentine Price. So at that point, I decided that I was going to be a opera singer. Um, to fast forward, I get to college. I go to college on a vocal scholarship, and my first vocal class, uh, my teacher. My professor says, uh, you sing too black. And I say that, and I never went to vocal class again. I changed my major, and I went to, never went to vocal class again. I say that, um, I would love to say I overcame, and I, I wound up doing something different. Quite frank, frankly, I landed in philanthropy. But I, I raise that, that in the context of when we talk about what is culture, and, and it was interesting even in the conversation before, where we were talking about um, blind auditions. Um, in auditions, you see with your ears. And then the question is, are the auditions blind? And, 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 the, and I raise that in the context of art in itself is an expression, and everyone has their stamp. For me, my voice was my own stamp. Right? But in that process, I was judged by an experience outside of myself that actually created or, or um, I became discouraged to not pursue a particular kind of um, dream that I had because someone else made a determination of culturally what I fit in and what I did not fit in. Right? I say that because I think it's really important, even in the question that we think about 
Um, I think all, all art forms have their own, their cultural dynamics, their own cultural roots. But I also think that we also have to be mindful that even in this, in, in the space, that the classical arts, um, there has been not only a race dynamic, but there's also been an elitism that has come along with that. And there's a particular frame that comes along with that as well. And I think that as we think about if we're really questioning how do we move, then we have to think about how do we, how do we hold this art form and how do we think about just individually, how has racism impacted us, right? And social exclusion impacted us to the, to the extent that it impacts the way we see, but it also impacts the way we hear. And most importantly, it impacts the way that we judge. So for me, art should be free to be art, right? And I think that there's uh, certainly, there's standards. Um, in, in high school, I was first chair, and I was competitive and loved being the first chair. And I, I think it's really important that we see music as a tool beyond um, just fitting someone's particular standard, but what is the highest and the best possibility for, for a child or a person with their talent and their gift to express themselves? That's the real power of art. Awesome. Thank you for that. Chris, let me ask you a slightly different question. I, in the last session, I think it was Ms. Johnson raised the notion of public accountability. And in nonprofit organizations, we don't have the same public accountability as the government. And yet we're publicly incorporated entities with boards, and the boards are theoretically representative democracy, right? They are meant to represent the public. What is the role of boards in this conversation? How do we need to think about how boards embrace these issues, how boards take responsibility, how boards pass them off as a pipeline conversation, any of that. Do you have a thought about boards and nonprofit governance? Sure. Um, let me begin by saying I will not sing. Um, <laughs> let me begin by thanking that you. <laughs> Pardon me? Let me begin by thanking you. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so the responsibility, I think boards have uh, a responsibility uh, uh, and let's stick with foundations because I think they will be different than nonprofit boards maybe. Uh, and there are some similarities, some differences, but certainly uh, foundations have a responsibility in my mind to, uh, and, it, and it's a little tricky because different foundations are set up for different reasons, but you ought to reflect the community you're serving. Um, and whether that community is statewide or whether it's a community foundation, you're reflecting a city or a particular region Whatever it is, you ought to have a board that reflects that community. So uh, to the degree that you don't do that, you have a responsibility to, uh, to make those kinds of changes, I think, that then uh, 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 get you in line. Uh, and, then, and then once you uh, have established your board, and I think we can get into this in greater detail, it's a question of what are the responsibilities of foundations uh, on this whole question of diversity uh, and equity, inclusion, the questions that we've been, we're trying to address today. Sharnita, you're sort of here in a double role. You have deep Detroit roots, and you are now working in New Jersey. Yes. And so you're able to look at the city, and you're able to think about the state you're working in. Do the issues play out exactly the same? Are there regional differences? Is it one problem that we're trying to solve, or is it a series of local problems? Yes, and. So um, I certainly have experienced, and I won't say culture shock in the sense um, of, because Detroit is diverse in, um, in a lot of ways, but culture shock in the sense of the number of nonprofit or arts organizations in New Jersey is tremendous. Um, and the number of arts organizations in Detroit, um, particularly culturally specific or ethnically specific organizations. Um, I had a lot of experience working with groups and while maybe the leadership in um, the organizations locally in Detroit were not as reflective of the city, I was working with artists and in communities and in neighborhoods that were reflective of, of the city. So I think spending time on the East Coast and seeing the, the opportunity that exists there 
um, has certainly um, been eye-opening eye for me, um, coming from Detroit and then going into a community. And New Jersey is a very, very diverse state with, I think, lots and lots of opportunities. Um, so, yes. Maureen, can I, in addition to sort of Maureen's day job, she's a national leader in many ways, and specifically on grant makers in the arts. And grant makers in the arts is sort of like a gin and tonic, everything you need to know is in the name. It's an association of grant makers in the arts. Um, and they've done what I think is some really powerful work on racial equity. And you've been a leader in that work. And you look at both, I can't remember the dichotomy, mainstream organizations, culturally specific, that's not the framing. But you look at every kind of organization and think about how folks have to approach those. So let me come back to my, my question to begin this panel. Should we understand symphony orchestras as culturally specific? Well, from my perspective, the short answer is yes. Right. Now, I, I wasn't mm -hmm. uh, privileged to be at the prior session, so right. I'm not sure about the context in which that right. question was raised. Right. So just um, as, as a word, um, you know, the New York Philharmonic, I think, has one non-white, non-Asian musician out of mm -hmm. 108. Um, Detroit Symphony just hired its first Latino musician. So there is a, there is a major problem um, mm -hmm. with orchestras that don't look like the populations that they exist in is sort of the context. Right. Okay, so yes, they are, cult <laughs> thank you. They are culturally specific, and I think part of the issue is that we don't recognize that. You have to really be able to define and articulate a problem before you can figure out how to solve for it. Uh, it's interesting, in terms of the question you asked Sharnita right. about whether the problems are the same in New Jersey as what she experienced here in Detroit. And, and I was sitting here thinking, well, you know, it's, that's uh, interesting to contemplate, you know, taking another example, Poverty is poverty. It may show up for your family different than it shows up for mine, but there's a structural issue that is creating and reinforcing that. And I think we see the same thing in terms of how we approach, um, how we value cultural expression, different modes of cultural expression, and those people who um, generate that cultural expression. The uh, symphony orchestra, um, does celebrate a particular kind of, and value a particular kind of culture, the Western canon, just to use shorthand. And by contrast, and, and there are a lot of reasons for that historically, but by contrast, we don't seem to understand in the same way um, forms of cultural expression generated by others, and it makes it hard for us to admit folks into those settings on the one hand and hard to appreciate how we might be enriched by other art forms on the other hand. Um, so, you know, I would say that things are really much more complicated than we acknowledge sometimes. Mm -hmm. And we tend to address things on uh, surface levels when we really need to do some very difficult spade work and it's uncomfortable right. and it's awkward and it's tense. But it's, I submit that it's, it's unavoidable. Right. And if I could just say one other please. thing, I yeah, apologize. No, just, you mentioned my role with grant makers in the arts. I, I chair the racial equity committee of um, the board for that organization. And it's been really important for us in terms of beginning to uh, understand this better, to be more precise with our language. That's a journey. We're not done. But I just want to say that for us, Diversity is not the same as equity, is not the same as inclusion. Mm -hmm. And we've been very explicit at GIA <laughs> that we are committed to racial equity. We understand it, you know, so in the same way when you think about community organizers and they look at a ladder of engagement mm -hmm. for the folks, their stakeholders and their constituents, we think that there is a ladder of engagement around racial equity as well. Diversity and inclusion are kind of a starting point. Mm -hmm. They are not the be in and uh, all and end all, but they are, it's a point of entry. Mm -hmm. And it's a very different equation and consideration, and it's even harder than those hard conversations I referenced a moment right. ago. So um, I'll stop there, but for the GIA frame, it's just important to be transparent about that. I think that's great. I want to come back to that for all of us in a minute, but Dr. Price, there was a lot of conversation about many of the issues we're experiencing with our arts organizations, with our musicians, with our professionals that are rooted in the schools. Uh -huh. And everyone, it's very easy for a leader of an arts organization to say, oh, there's a pipeline problem. Our schools aren't turning out enough talented people. All we need to do is fix our schools. Mm -hmm. Right? All we need to do is fix our schools. 
piece of cake. Indeed, we need to fix our schools. <laughs> However, <laughs> <laughs> but talk us through it, that. It, I mean, it is, it's, it's more than fix our schools. I think that one of the things that we have to recognize is that we really do have, I think, some cultural barriers in starting early with young people who are given experiences and introductions to cultures beyond their own so that they have an opportunity to have choice to about choice. the kind of art that speaks to their soul. Right. So I would disagree with your comment on a classical orchestra being a um, culturally specific orchestra. I think that its origins obviously are European. However, if indeed you introduce young people to classical music at age three, four, five, et cetera, it becomes their own as well as all of the other genres that are out there. And I think that from my perspective, that's what we want in our educational systems, that every student is introduced to all of the arts, that we are talking about diversity in the arts, but we should also be talking about diversity of the of arts. Art. I think that's great. Just, it, it, Question that's maybe too big, but did our, have our public schools ever gotten it right? Was there a golden age of public education in this country when we were educating our children? For and some children. I mean children. That by everyone. Right. No, I mean all our children, right? No, oh, no. I'm talking about a public system, <laughs> no, which means all of the public. No, uh, we have never gotten it right in this country. Um, we have had really good public education for some children, and we have had abysmal education for some children throughout our history. Can we fix it? Is it solvable? Absolutely, if we had the will to do so. But unfortunately, I think we are lacking that will as a society. I'd love to pick up on, on the conversation Maureen started. And this isn't entirely true, but I think it's maybe true enough. If you think about a journey from diversity to inclusion to equity. You can either read those as stages of development, right? I have to get through the diversity conversation in order to have the inclusion conversation so I can arrive at the equity conversation. Or that can simply be a delaying tactic, right? I can't get to equity because I have two other things I need to do first. So we'll do equity in 2075, right? <laughs> can we leap from, you know, in, in some ways, if we think about, and I don't mean to pick on classical musicians, but I think the problem is very apparent in our symphony orchestras when you have a number like one African-American musician of 108 New York Philharmonic. Do we have to wait for them to get through diversity? Do we have to wait for them to get through inclusion in order to have the equity conversation? Or can we leapfrog? Can we jump straight into it? And that's not just a question for Maureen. I think everyone probably has something, but happy to start with Maureen, happy to start with anyone else. Um, it is possible, but I think improbable. Right. Um, I think that um, one is challenged to engage uh, an inquiry in a very authentic way right. and in a committed way right. um, and in a patient way. You know, it's, it's a really interesting dilemma because we really have run out of time in some ways, mm -hmm. but we must invest the time and discipline that's required to come to um, authentic understanding. So I'm, I'm not so sure we can leapfrog, or that it's likely right. that we can leapfrog. I think, you know, there's this maxim in the fashion industry, you know, cut, uh, measure twice, cut once. Right. And I think, you know, what that's indicating is you have to put in the care on the front end to ensure the integrity of the product you get on the back end, or else you're going to have to start over anyway. Right. And I think the same maxim applies here, that right. you really have to put that time in, put that care in, put that effort in on the front end to ensure the integrity of the outcome on the back end. It, you Which know, I, I actually um, think that at the core of the question, of your question, is part of the problem. Um, part of the problem is that I think the starting point, uh, diversity is a means to an end right, mm -hmm. and that the starting point should be equity. 
how you get there may be diversity and inclusion. Unfortunately, I think, and we, I think we think very linear around, you know, um, well, let's have diversity first, and then we have inclusion first, and then, then we have this first. I mean, it's, it's when you think on those lines, you're not starting from a framework of equity. You're starting from the perspective of how much can I tolerate, right? right? And I think it's really important for us to be honest around um, what frame we start for. Is our goal to have a diverse? Do we measure the success of the orchestra based on, I've got two black people now, right? right? Or two Latino now? Or are we really looking to, um, are we courageous enough to look at the art form as an opportunity for butterflies to be in their sanctuary to share their story and their gifts. And that, and that our goal ultimately that we recognize that there's been, there's been structural um, barriers that have created inequities in all phases of our society. And I think that that's a slightly, it's, it, we start with one, because it's, it's easier to, to feel progress um, um, when you can visually see that there are people, right? right. Culture is, diff is much harder to change. So what we're really talking about, I think, is a question of do we want cultural, do we want a cultural shift? What paradigm are we looking at? Are we looking at the are we looking at um, a mode of yes, this orchestra is enriched? And, and maybe one is the other. I don't know the question. I mean, no. um, because we've got more diversity, or are we really looking at the fullness? What what are the possibilities of full cultural expression? No. Chris, I want to just open up the frame. I want you to respond, respond to this, and I just I'll throw this on and feel free to add it or not. You work across many areas as the president of a foundation, and you have a lot of background um, and experience with the environmental movement. And the environmental movement has had many of the same issues about structural racism, issues of equity, and all of that. A version of the question I asked Sharnita, are they the same issues? Can the arts community learn from the environmental community? Are they different? Are they the same? So feel free to add that to what you were so going to say or not. Let, let, me, let me go back first to, I, I'm where Natasha's. I think you have to start with saying, let's start with equity. Right. And, and, and I want to also go back to Dr. Price's comment and bring them together, and that is that, so it starts with um, first getting people in our society to value arts the way they value STEM right, right now. Right. Okay, right. so we ought to be thinking STEAM instead of STEM. Right. Science, and technology, then, and engineering, then, math. And, and we need to have and then how do we make that happen? So we make that happen in a number of ways. In, at least in New Jersey, we have a requirement starting in kindergarten, K through 12. Um, there's a requirement for um, uh, opportunities in dance, music, theater, and visual arts. And kids have to be exposed to all those. And it gives them a chance to determine what it is that makes them special and what, makes, what, what, what speaks to them. And, um, and then you have to have metrics to determine whether you're actually doing that. So you've got to go in and see, are schools offering those programs? Are they doing it according to the requirements? And then once you figure that out, are you, you know, all along the way, what, then what opportunities are you giving them after school? What opportunities are you giving them in all, from the beginning to the end? And then, so you talk about equity, give everybody that same opportunity. And then if you do that, and, you, and then you follow up with uh, good metrics to, to right. and then enforcement, and you need to have some mechanism to, to make sure people do that, then you're, you're, you're on the path, I think, to doing the right thing. That's great. I'm going to ask a question of Dr. Price, then I'm going to open it up to the room. Because again, I think this is a conversation folks want to participate in. So feel free to start lining up at the mics. Feel free to raise a hand if you want a mic brought to you. And I forgot to say earlier, we do have some questions coming in from Twitter. So we also have a colleague who will be, who will be checking that. Dr. Price, I started to ask you a question backstage that you didn't get a chance to answer. Um, so I'm not going to ask you on stage. <laughs> so uh, recently, a, a court ruling came down that said that the state of Michigan has no affirmative responsibility to provide a quality education to its students, simply a public education. Right? Mm -hmm. So this is this is court. This is the state supreme court, I believe. Mm -hmm. That everyone is pointing back to education as the root, as the cause, as the cure. We now have a state that said any education is good enough. Where do we begin in that context, given what we're looking at in the reality, given what we're facing, given what's happening in the state? 
where do we begin? What, what do you want this room of people to think and do and know about our schools? What is step one? Well, step one, I think, is caring about education, caring about the young people in our schools and understanding that all of our futures are going to be affected by the way in which they are or are not well educated. And so I think that that is an important um, dialogue that we have to have in our communities about what is a quality education. And in the state of Michigan, unfortunately, we have so many people who are so focused on choice as though that were the primary issue as opposed to choice with quality. Uh, we, we just are at that point where those individuals who are in the charter school movement, and I'm not against charter schools. I serve on the charter school board, so that's, that's not my point. My point is that we have to agree that we want every child to be well educated so that they are competitive in our world and that they have options available to them. I just think that that is important. And it's also important that we begin to understand that we come to these issues with a particular frame too often about what, it, what does it mean to talk about uh, the way in which we educate, who we educate, and the values that go with that. Uh, when uh, Natasha was speaking earlier, I, uh, it came to mind something that just happened with me this week. I frequently get a lot of calls from individuals and organizations that are looking for uh, students in the arts to perform at different events. There is a major entity in town that has a new CEO that is going to be coming next month and they want to have students perform at this big reception that they are planning. And so the individual who's planning this event called and said, oh, we know that the Detroit Public Schools has a wonderful jazz uh, combo. And would you be able to arrange for us to have the jazz combo? And I said, well, now who's going to be at this event? Well, we're inviting the governor. We're inviting all of the CEOs of every major uh, corporation and organization in town. I said, hmm, why are you asking for the jazz combo? Why aren't you asking for the harp students at Cass Tech? silence on the other end of the phone. And I said, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call the harp teacher. And I think that those are the students who would fit right in with this CEO group. And he said, oh, all right. <laughs> but I relate that because I'm coming back to the, your comment about the frame that we use so often when we think about the arts, when we think about the way in which we uh, enculturate, if you will, individuals. And so if we really have true diversity, true inclusion, and true equity, then everybody has every option. Mm -hmm. And we've right. got to get there. That's right. Right. I think that's right. I think that's exactly right. Let's go right over here. Please say a word about who you are and join the conversation. All right, thanks, Jamie. I'm Rick Robinson. I was actually a member of the double bass section of Detroit Symphony for 22 years. So I made it. <laughs> <laughs> and I like to think that I made it uh, not only because I grew up in a classical music family, my older brother and sister had so much fun playing uh, strings. Uh, with their friends in school that it rubbed off on me when it came my turn, um, but also that um, my family allowed me to be open and multicultural to uh, everything that's available, uh, a citizen of the world rather than just a citizen of Highland Park, Michigan, which is right up the street. So going back to your original question, you know, is a symphony or orchestra a culturally specific idea? I think the answers are yes and no, and it depends yes. on an attitude, mm -hmm. an attitude which is often inherited uh, within our communities, uh, from our parents, uh, from our teachers, from our peers, uh, and all the social uh, pressures that, that come on. 
and right now we're in a great time of uh, turmoil and, and turnover, uh, f cultural fragmentation, if you will, where just about, about everyone is empowered to be creative in some kind of ways, whether we consider that uh, fine art or just art or just creative, uh, so they feel empowered enough, uh, rather than needing to take up the violin and learn how to play the Tchaikovsky concerto. Um, uh, but at the same time, there's a social um, uh, baggage that comes with uh, uh, in, in, well, avoiding authenticity. This word of authenticity comes up again and again. You know, how authentic are we being? Uh, to our culture or where we grew up. So I know in, in my community, you know, playing classical music was not a popular thing to do. So we were bucking the trend, if you will. So it takes this kind of stubbornness. And whenever I go speak to uh, kids in Highland Park, you know, I tell them to be stubbornly independent uh, if you want to succeed at something and, and embracing the, the standards that, um, that are, come from the past uh, in order to climb up that ladder of doing what you eventually want to do or giving back to the community or getting beyond all this. So um, we have issues of cultural appropriation are coming into discussion nowadays. So, uh, but we have to realize that um, there's a double standard at play. Uh, I see uh, blues and jazz artists, uh, very few of whom are black. And you know, it's no problem for them to uh, take up a different culture or music, uh, so it shouldn't be a problem for us to take on classical music. Absolutely, thank you very much for that. Was there someone here? Hi, welcome. Hi, my name is Unique Session. I'm actually a student at the University of Michigan um, and a product of Detroit Public Schools. Both of my parents are actually public school teachers at Detroit Public Schools. Um, I was actually a singer in harp and vocal, so when you gave that shout out, I was really, <laughs> really excited. Um, and so those, those students that actually play the harp are exposed in high school, so I want to put that mm -hmm. in the air as well. Um, and they go on to play in different orchestras right. and in colleges as well. Um, and I'm actually a sound engineer at the University of Michigan in the Performing Arts Technology program. And so I've done this you know, immersion of the arts and technology and engineering and science and how we do that. And when you talked about auditory, that's something that for me has always come um, very hand in hand to what my gift is and how I listen to things and stay attuned. And so I think the question um, that I, I would like to propose is the understanding of what are we listening for? Right. Are we listening for cultures represented? Are we listening for the sound of what it means to represent yourself right. in a space of a cultural the, um, immersion and understanding of, of what it means to be global and inclusive. I went uh, out of the country for the first time uh, this past summer, uh, the first from my family to go out of the country. And so now I'm really looking at it from a global diaspora of what it means to be um, a representation of a minority um, throughout all uh, <laughs> genres of life, not just in music and the arts. Um, so I think that, that that's my overall question is, what is the sound that we're looking for? Are we looking for a sound of unison? Are we looking for a sound of equality and understanding? Or is it really just about equity? Thank you very much. I'm going to stack a couple of questions just because I promised to do this one on time. So we're going to run <laughs> through these, and then we'll sort of combine the questions and give everyone a chance. So let me come here, and then Maria will come right back to you. Hi, my name is Jason Sang. I'm the, cult, uh, I'm the community engagement specialist with Fractured Atlas. And uh, I just wanted to respond really briefly to your initial question about culturally specific organizations being symphonies and et cetera. So I will accept symphonies and Lord theaters and operas as culturally specific organizations if they're willing to donate 90% of their contributed income to Alana organizations, because that <coughs> is what the people of color organizations have been having, having to deal with for as long as they've been in existence, so point one. Uh, but my question for the panel is, how can we make foundations in the philanthropic sector at large as accountable to the public as they are to their boards? Thank you very much for that. I'm taking that. Maria. Yes, Maria de Leon from the National Association of Latino Arts and Cultures. And I just want to start with the statistics. You know, by the year 2020, the majority of young people in this country will be people of color. And I think that we need to really take that in, into account and really start thinking about this idea of, of belonging, of valuing other expressions, not just the mainstream expression. And I think that uh, there are very, there's a history of deep layers of uh, economic disparity and issues of race that play into that. And so as we think about 
the, you asked the question if it was a culturally specific organization, right. and yes, you many say. mainstream organizations are culturally specific, and they have had the benefit of generations of support from, from major you know, private and public uh, entities, and so look what they have built, and look what they have, have achieved with this. Think about the organizations and the expressions in our communities, whether Latino, African American, Asian, Native American, how could we and our communities and our children benefit from those generations of support to also achieve uh, what other mainstream institutions and mainstream communities have achieved? So let's stop this cultural segregation and really invite and include everyone. Thank Excellent. You. Maria, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Rodney Gilbert, uh, Executive Director of Yendo Productions, Yendo Arts out of New Jersey. Hey, Chris. <laughs> so, I've been, so I'm still stuck in the previous session, which I'll bring it forward to this session, where we talk about um, the value. Uh, and I want to talk about the value of arts and the value of people of color. And how do we have an authentic conversation about inclusion on an upper level of management? because uh, that's how you start to diversify stuff. Uh, and is it the responsibility of the panelists in your various jobs to have the authentic conversation, which is uncomfortable, like you said, because we're in a country, in our nation right now, where brown people are not valued. I mean, I talk about it all the time, and it's hard for me to sidestep it because I'm included. You know, and it happens in theater, it happens in other performing arts, and it happens in the visual arts. Uh, how, uh, how committed are we to a, a drastic, radical change so that we don't have to wait another, you know, 40 years so that I can live and see it? Excellent. I think we're going to take two more here, and then we're going to come to the panel, and we're going to do them. Okay, well, um, my name is Maya Stone, and I'm the, I play bassoon with the, um, second bassoon with the Sphinx Symphony, and um, I'm coming from the Nashville area, um, so I was glad to hear about uh, Celerando, and I've already uh, suggested to a parent of a student of mine <laughs> to um, seek out information from you. Um, but, uh, and I play with the Huntsville Symphony in Alabama, second bassoon, I've been with them since 2007, and I've held uh, various full-time academic positions. But um, I was really glad to hear Natasha say uh, what you did about um, your teacher saying that uh, you sounded too black. Because I, I think that that's really, really, really important. And um, what does black mean? You know, I, I think that question. Um, and so my experience, um, you know, we all go through different microaggressions, you know, um, growing, growing up and stuff. And, um, and have to deal with that uh, on a psychological, emotional, and um, you know, just living level. Um, and, and when I was an undergrad, <clears throat> I uh, and I found myself um, like inundated with white, <laughs> which um, you know I had all white uh, teachers and all white male teachers, and they were wonderful, and I got so much information from them. Um, but you know, I started to feel you know, and the historical. Uh, information that was surrounding me and how I was learning things, it was all Western European, you know, mm -hmm. and, I, and I just felt like I'm, I'm missing, I'm losing myself, you know, mm -hmm. I felt at one point. So um, I ended up getting an Africana Studies minor and that like really turned me around, you know, in terms of, um, uh, I mean, I always had a, a high feeling of myself, you know, I knew that I was special, blah, blah, blah. But um, it, I just needed to put things in perspective. So, um, so my, I guess my, part of my question to you is, and I, I've also um, been aware of certain ways that um, kids are addressed when it comes to classical music, and I'm sure this isn't everywhere, but um, like uh, I was at an educational, uh, involved with an educational performance um, uh, within the last few years, and uh, the, the very, uh, it was an undercurrent, but very uh, impaling message was that um, it, uh, classical ballet was better than any other dance. It was the highest form of dance you could ever learn. Everything else is sub, you know. Uh, 
it was very, very, and I talked to some people that I'd, I'd invited to the performance, um, some uh, a black friend of mine and her daughter, and they were like, oh, but it's, you know, I don't know if we could ever, you know, it's so like, you know, this, the pedestal. And, and I just felt like, but, you know, you, you have something of value to offer, and you know what I mean? It's, um, but my question is, <laughs> um, do you do you feel like there's there's a way for us to address that at a, a national or um, you know because I don't know if it's it's a, a U.S. thing or you know a, a, a national or even I don't know I'm going to say national right now level um, to to various orchestras educational entities you know we have diversity training and stuff like that but does that really get to the heart of the matter and how can we how can we start to address this? Or do you think it needs to be addressed? You know. Fantastic. Thank you. One last comment, and then we're going to come to the panel. Yes, Jamie. Thank you. Uh, my name is Peter Langer, and I'm the dean of CCM in Cincinnati, and also a, a former uh, horn player with the Baltimore Symphony for 29 years. Oh. So I, I really straddle both of these sides. Uh, and, and working with a, a state institution uh, as a university, I'm able to raise uh, funds from, uh, from private funders and foundations for, for diversity scholarships. I'm able to give those. I make hiring decisions, and, and that, is, that is an open uh, system where I can choose someone of color to continue to diversify our students, our staff, and our, um, our faculty. Yet when I was a member of, of a musician, our union told us that uh, to be fair and to be colorblind was the irony uh, of, of the phrase uh, that all of our auditions were screened. Uh, this is an irony that has to stop. So how can our funders help us work with our unions and get this changed? Because we are discriminating against the very people that we need to bring into our pipelines. Thank you very much. So panelists, I want you to remember the frame we have for our two days together, which is we want people to wake up tomorrow and do something different. Right? We want them to actually do something different tomorrow. We want them to leave here knowing something new. So we heard questions about what are we listening for. We heard questions about how can we make sure that foundations are accountable to a broad public, not just their boards. I heard a question about how do we rely on public education to undo decades of disinvestment while we're disinvesting in our public schools. I've heard questions about management structure. I've heard questions about discomfort. How do we have a real conversation that involves discomfort? I heard a really powerful question about why is my culture the core curriculum and someone else's culture an elective? I've heard really powerful questions about can we address issues of race and be colorblind? So answer all of that, and you have 30 <laughs> seconds each. No. So, <laughs> so reflect on that. Reflect on that holistically. Think about the things you want people to leave here. Think about the things you want them to do. And I'm going to start at this end with you, Dr. Paul. Thanks. <laughs> I'm more um, scared of Latasha than I am of you. So. <laughs> I think that the answer to probably all of those issues is that leadership matters. We have to be, I think, much more conscious of who is in a leadership position and thus in decision-making roles. And when we are aware of how people come into leadership and we influence that, I think that we will be able to address the various questions because we will be conscious about putting people in decision-making roles uh, that are individuals who want to bring about the kind of equity that all of us are seeking. And so we have to challenge leaders on that very question of how they begin to make decisions around issues of equity, around issues of diversity and inclusion, to ensure that all of our institutions, whether it's an arts organization or a foundation like I lead, or whatever the case may be, that they are honed in on those kinds of issues and questions. Thank you. Maureen. 
So uh, to speak specifically to foundations, I think there's an opportunity for us to start at home, right. to look at who uh, is, comprises our board and staff, and to your point about decision making, mm -hmm. this is for me is you know, one of the distinctions between diversity and equity, is right. you know, who has authority mm -hmm. and responsibility for certain sorts of uh, decisions. And, and so I think often if we start there, we'll find a rich trove of things for which to work, that we can start there and make it better. Right. And at the same time, I think, and there are things that we do already just as a matter of practice um, that could be easy points of entry. For example, many foundations, when you submit an application or proposal, they collect diversity information. Not all of them, but often they do. Mm -hmm. I don't submit that diversity is enough, however, what happens with that information once they get it? Do they really engage their grantees about what that means? Do they lift the veil on that? You know, instead of just saying we have X number of Alana staff, or uh, what are the positions that those people are in? Uh, and how do we hold them accountable for that? We often don't even engage conversations with them. So that's an easy way to start is to ask some questions about what's there of the institutions with whom we partner as grantees, and ourselves, and we often don't do that. We might say we care about a particular mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. but if you don't demonstrate it through your actions, then you don't get to the outcomes that you're looking for. So I think we can just start with interrogating ourselves and the partners. The last thing I'll say just very quickly is relationship building. I said authenticity a couple times earlier, and someone else mentioned it as well. And I, I can't emphasize that enough. Relationships that are mutually beneficial, and often for foundations, they are more one-sided. We assume we have all the answers and we're doing a favor, but to the, the final point of public accountability, mm -hmm. these, are public, these are funds in the public trust, mm -hmm. in fact. And so we do have an obligation to have them be used to inure to the benefit of our communities. Mm -hmm. So we just have to give some quality time to thinking about what that looks like to have our funding inured to the benefit of our communities. Excellent. Thank you. Sharnita. I mean, I actually think that philanthropy is struggling with this question as well. So, um, so we probably have as many questions as answers. Mm -hmm. um, I completely agree with Maureen around we're running out of time. Um, and I'm certainly growing very impatient. Um, so I think when we think about how we are the leadership pipeline, I think, is important. I think about the networks is very important. And when we think about um, positions in an organization, so oftentimes I'll hear from grantees, well, we know we just couldn't find anybody. We sent out job postings and nobody applied. When is the last time you got a job from a job posting? <laughs> like, it's about <laughs> network. At a certain point in your career, it really is about who you know, who can be a sponsor for you, who can be a mentor or a coach, who can put you in the room that you need to be in. So I think ar around foundations sort of um, going on this journey together with our grantees and trying to understand what the barriers are and what role we can play and not having all the answers, certainly, um, because we're questioning ourselves as well, mm -hmm. um, is, is the, I think, the, the central question. Excellent. Thank you so much. Chris. Hard to disagree with anything that's been said so far. Uh, and. Um, Foundations really do need to start by asking themselves questions and, and asking what is it in our own policies, our procedures, our grant making, um, our training programs, all the sorts of things that we do in the foundation world. What are we doing that may be sending the wrong signal to people uh, that we don't care about these issues? Uh, let me give you an example. Um, we talk a, a lot, at, we talk a lot at the Dodge Foundation about we support um, only excellence. We support organizations of excellence. And, and how do we define excellence? Well, you have to have a um, certified audit. You have to have a board that gives 100%, 100% giving by board members. Um, so a number of organizations that may be just beginning or um, aren't established, because it usually ends up going to the most established organizations, Sometimes we need to take a little more risk and say, well, maybe if we work with organizations that um, we're doing some of the real um, groundbreaking work in addressing some of these questions, but may be small and may not be uh, as, uh, have, have not been around as long, 
that we need to say, okay, maybe if we work with them, they will have a certified audit in a couple of years, but uh, or that we'll get them to work with a board and eventually get to 100% uh, of funding by their board members. Those are the kinds of things that's sort of a little more risk-taking, if you will, because these are questions that have not been addressed historically by foundations. It just is the way the world has worked. And so we need to figure out how to turn that around. And we need to try everything we can to turn that around um, from both asking ourselves how we operate, but also trying to look more deeply around to see who's doing the best job in these areas and how can we support them, even if they may not fulfill all our definitions of what good grant making might be uh, historically. When, as, as people were talking, um, V's kept po popping up to me, and I, I guess I had three V's that came up. One was value, the second was a variety, and the third is voice. And in the context of what I think that philanthropy can do, and even just using um, that three-legged stool, is how many, I, I'll ask a question, how many of you out here love the classical arts? How many of you out here are artists, or musicians? How many of you work in philanthropy? There's a lot of love in this room. And I say that to say that you are the change agents. There's only, there's every movement you can attach to, you can find there were a few people who were rooted in a belief around values. What is it that you value? Do we really value diversity and inclusion in the arts? Do we give voice to it? If you work in philanthropy, one of the things about the privileges of philanthropy is oftentimes we have the ability to convene these conversations. We have the ability to pull communities together. We have the, the ability to be able to create a space, a voice for communities that normally do not have opportunities to actually um, um, have conversations around these particular issues. And then variety, I raise that because um, in the context, the, the, the whole idea of colorblind, I absolutely hate that term, because at the end of the day, um, no one is really colorblind, and who wants to be colorblind? I like to go to, to, to the garden, and I like to see the red roses, and the pink tulips, and the yellow carnations. That's what gives beauty and depthness to the world, just like colors in the, art, colors in the notes in music. So I'll just say, that um, I guess I'll, I'll just leave and say that all of you all are the ambassadors. I don't know if there's a magic key. I mean, of course there are things that we can learn, but if you love and you're passionate about this, then you are the ambassador. You are the best one within your institution, within your organization, to really think about and create these conversations um, and the opportunity for us to really think about how do we move forward. Excellent. Thank you very much. Hold your applause for one second. Do we have housekeeping notes? This is the last session of this. Folks are on dinner on their own and then know what to do. And then back at 8 o'clock? Okay, excellent. So having said that, please join me in thanking this panel for a really great conversation. I don't know whose water that was, so I hope it's okay.